Hello, my name is Chris Stoneman. I'm a CTO and co-founder at Code Security. And today I'm gonna to talk about AWS Forensics and Instant Response. So there are lots of different types of instants that you might see in a cloud provider like AWS. You might have service disruption, we are unable to access resources. You might have unauthorized access to those resources, potentially even worse. And there are lots of different types of breaches too. Um, so you have privilege escalation, where someone potentially an attacker or potentially someone with legitimate access has escalated their privileges. And then that can also lead to, or separately, you're gonna have information exposure, credential exposure. If, for example, someone has stolen credentials, it also helps them escalate their privileges. So quite a lot of different types of incidents. Some of these are probably more causes than incidents themselves, but lots of different types of things that you could be looking at. And do check out AWS Instant Response in your pajamas from AWS for, for more on this slide. You want to split out the different types of instance based on their domain. So this is from the AWS white paper themselves. And for example, there is a service domain. So this includes things like AWS IAM or access management, things like the billing APIs as well. So all that kind of metadata and the kind of control plane around the resources you're running. Then you have the infrastructure domain. So that is probably what you're more used to if you're a traditional instant responder. This includes things like the compute. So Amazon EC2, maybe Kubernetes containers, other things that basically running your code. And then you have the application domain. So this is the application itself, and include things like the application logs. Then obviously there are overlaps between all these things too. So it's not quite a clear cut definition, but the reason this might be useful is that if you're looking at an instant, it's good to know what types of data you can be dealing with and what types of resources you'll need to isolate as well. So some more common attacks in the cloud, there's misconfigurations, as mentioned, stolen credentials. So for example, maybe you've posted your AWS access keys and secret keys to GitHub, in which case AWS will probably let you know about that. Phishing as well, lots of interesting recent phishing attacks. So some of those um, big gaming companies that are in the news being compromised recently, the root cause of those based on reports was phishing. So someone pretending to be AWS, asking for their password, that kind of stuff. Quite interesting, you do occasionally get things like poison gold images or libraries. So for example, someone backdooring the build to your Amazon machine images. And then of course, open S3 buckets and the rest. So there's a few ways you might know that you have a problem. For one thing, Amazon themselves might let you know. They're actually pretty good at scanning and detecting potential issues. You might notice that you have weird users and roles in your IAM. Or you might notice, for example, you have an increase in your billings or high CPU usage across your resources, in which case it's likely you're seeing something like crypto jacking. I'm going to touch really briefly on shared responsibility. You're probably bored of this if you've seen other talks on AWS IR. Um, but basically, you're responsible for most things um, in your environment when it comes to AWS. AWS will be responsible, for example, for a vulnerability in their API to do with EC2, or that kind of underlying um, control plane stuff. But really, when it comes down to compromised instances, compromised containers, um, it's on you. And the reason this can be a challenge in terms of responding to these incidents is because one thing is getting that data is hard. It's not like the old days on prem you could walk over to the system and you know, copy a hard drive off something to USB. And also just understanding both what data you can get and how you can isolate those systems is quite tricky as well. Again, very different to on prem and different kind of skill set to learn there. So the steps for responding to AWS are actually pretty similar to any other environment. So first of all, you need to scope the incident. So that means finding out kind of what resources were impacted and how bad it might be. So for example, it's quite different responding to one container versus multiple AWS accounts across an AWS organization, in which case things can get a lot more serious. Obviously though, it depends too on where your crown jewels are. So if it's a key system, that's still pretty bad. The next step is to collect evidence and data. Without that, you won't be able to analyze that data to then get kind of insights and know, for example, what the root cause was. If you haven't found out what the root cause was, it's very unlikely you may have to respond to the incident container. And that typically involves things like isolating systems, disconnecting them, et cetera. And then finally, do you document the instant. Unfortunately, it's pretty unlikely over the last instant that you face. If you documented it, well, for one thing, it's less likely to happen again because you can put some of those learnings in and also makes the next incident a bit easier too. So there's all kinds of data that AWS you might be dealing with. But in particular, if it's an EC2, you can look at things like getting snaps on the disks, that's very important. 
Um, potentially, you want to get memory dumps and other data from the live system if you SSH or SSM on. And you can also get all the cloud trail log and other metadata. Be there really with EC2, though, for those snapshots of the volumes. With EKS, so Kubernetes, you can get things like the audit logs, control plane logs in S3. You can also get a bunch of data from the Docker file system, particularly if it's running on the EC2 rather than Fargate. And then also inside that container itself, you can pull out things like potentially memory, depending on some settings, and also all the key files, for example, malware and other logs. ECS is similar. Um, inside the container, you can get access using ECS execute at kubectl if you have permissions. There's a bunch of stuff you need to do there. And finally, Lambda. It's pretty easy to get things like CloudTrail logs and old versions of the Lambda function itself. Quite hard to get live access to that running container it's on, unless you're doing things like importing libraries, which can get that access, which is beyond the scope of this. Yeah, there's a bunch of logging in AWS. We've actually got a separate talk just on that. But do check out CloudWatch, CloudTrail, and also S3. But different services log to different places in different formats, which does not make things easy. Again, we have a talk just on AWS IAM, so we're going to too much detail. But AWS IAM is to do with access management. And if you respond to an incident, it's pretty key to know what kind of data you'll be dealing with in terms of logs. So CloudTrail will capture those API calls to IAM and the secure token service. There's also the useful access analyzer, and that's that screenshot on the right there, which, if enabled, will show you some interesting detail around who accessed what. In terms of blocking access to some of that access management, well, there's a really good lab from AWS themselves. Um, this is a screenshot of it where they show you how to use the Amazon CLI to block access. So here there's a policy, um, deny all policy, you're applying to the role. As kind of mentioned before, if you're responding in EC2, there's a few different things you can do. I mean, you can just turn it off, obviously, but beware of the potential impact there. You can also isolate it, which might have less impact. So you can isolate the network level by disconnecting from the VPC, essentially using security groups to block all internet access. Um, normally, you want to apply a new security group rather than just deleting and changing the old one because you want to analyze it potentially. Uh, also, there's an instance profile attached to the EC2. It has IAM access, so you need to go and lock that down as well and check for any access it had. For example, the EC2 is compromised, and that profile had access to S3. You could have had some more data lost there as well. <clears throat> and finally, do take a snapshot of the EC2, because then you can analyze it later on. I can't discover what VPC is, but basically networking, particularly in EC2, um, you can isolate the security groups. And this is a slide from a great talk, AWS IR in your pajamas, um, including some CLI commands for isolating, particularly the load balancer involved. There is a free tool from AWS on GitHub, which is pretty useful. Um, I think there's a diagram on the right. It will collect data, forensic data from EC2s, as well as potentially contain them. When we test this out, I think it took a couple of hours for it to isolate and uh, contain a small machine, so a little bit slow, um, but it's free. So you know, it's worth playing with. As I mentioned before, there's a ton of different data you can get, particularly if you look at containers in AWS. So in S3, you'll have a bunch of types of logs, also CloudTrail. Then interestingly, you actually have the Docker file system. So these days, it's normally overlay 2 as a version file system. And if it's EKS, it will be on the EC2 if you're running on an EC2 um, as opposed to Fargate. And it's basically all the file systems, all the containers will be there available to you. You can also access inside the container itself. So you can get data from inside as well, both files and also things like memory. So in terms of making this a little bit easier to do, here at Kado, we can do a bunch of stuff. So with our platform, you can import with a single click from EC2, ECS, et cetera. Also do all this stuff via the API as well, which is pretty important if you want to grab this data before it gets uh, before it's gone, if it's the thermal infrastructure. In terms of what that looks like, after we've grabbed that data, we automatically process and analyze it, run detections, pass logs, that kind of stuff. And in this example here, I've got an Amazon EC2 that's compromised for some crypto mining malware and also a bunch of logs too. So some guard duty and cloud share logs too, also imported in the same view. I can see some of the analysis here. We broke it down by mitre attacks. You can see a web shell was used to deploy some malware, later on crypto mining, et cetera. And you can see interesting here too, um, side by side, there's a record from the Apache access logs. We can see the attacker pulling something down from pastebin through a web shell. 
if I browse down, I can't because it's a screenshot, you then see some things on the AWS side of the house. So in guard duty, you then see some malware being detected and some access to Tor. It's very important to build this unified timeline to find root cause, whether that's with KDO or another tool. And then finally, we can also automate that response too. So in this example here, I've enabled an automation rule, which will trigger when there's a guard duty alert, it will then automatically capture that forensics data, so preserve it, do an automated investigation to confirm if that guard duty alert is false positive or not. And with guard duty, you're dealing with a lot of false positives. And then if it is a confirmed positive, at that point, isolate the instance by disconnecting on the network and also isolating the IAM rule. And yeah, this is what that kind of process looks like. At the end of the day, you don't want to be doing this manually. However you choose to do it, you don't want to be manually responding to a large number of these alerts because for one thing, the data will be gone. And finally, if you'd like to try a KD response, you can. Google KD response, click the link below or visit that URL there and you get a free 14-day trial. Thank you.